Hello. Bacterial endocarditis is a life-threatening infection of the heart valves and it's universally fatal if not recognized and treated in time. Most commonly it's caused by gram-positive bacteria like the infamous Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococci, bacteria that normally colonize the human skin and the gastrointestinal tract including the mouth. And most of the time they cause no problems whatsoever. But if there is a break, a disruption in the integrity of the skin or the mucosa, then these bacteria can enter the bloodstream and find their way to the heart valves. So a bad untreated skin infection or a skin abscess or an infected wound can serve as a gateway for bacteremia, not to mention intravenous drug use with contaminated needles. Regarding the mouth, people with very poor oral hygiene and oral health, people with periodontitis, so with gum disease, right, they are at risk for endocarditis. Also people with colon cancer. Cancer creates ulcers and an ulcer on the mucosa literally serves as a highway for bacteria to enter the bloodstream. So this is how bacteremia happens, but bacteremia does not necessarily translate into endocarditis because the endocardium, the endothelium is normally very smooth and quite resistant to bacterial adhesion. But if it gets damaged as well, then this makes endocarditis much more likely. So. How would a healthy endothelium get damaged? If there is any kind of valvular abnormality, either acquired or innate, or worse yet, if there is an artificial heart valve, the blood flow through the valve becomes turbulent and turbulent blood flow causes a lot of wear and tear to the endothelium, there is chronic low-grade inflammation and damage and this is enough for bacteria like Staphylococcus aureus to stick to the valves and start multiplying. And once they do, eventually they will create a biofilm. A biofilm is a collection of bacteria, organic matter and fibrin. And given enough time, it will turn into what we call a vegetation. A vegetation, this is actually what endocarditis is. It's a lump of bacteria and organic matter on the heart valve and gradually it will destroy the valve and cause heart failure. But even before that happens, since this vegetation is soft and mushy, parts of it will start to break off and they will end up in the bloodstream. And naturally from the heart they can end up pretty much anywhere in the body. So this infection can spread into the brain, into the kidneys, the liver, the spleen, into bones, muscles, everywhere, right? And this is what makes endocarditis so problematic. Local damage to the heart, but most importantly, these metastatic infections that can end up anywhere. So now that we got the basic pathophysiology out of the way, let's see how you can actually suspect that your patient might have endocarditis. I'm sure you've heard of the Duke criteria that are usually used in the diagnosis of endocarditis, but for me personally, memorizing clinical criteria has never really worked in the long run. I prefer to actually understand the diagnosis or the condition that I'm trying to diagnose. So let's see how the Duke criteria work in real life. Your patients with endocarditis will seek medical attention basically for two reasons. Number one, fever, usually prolonged fever with or without signs of sepsis. And two, symptoms of complications of endocarditis. First and foremost, these metastatic infections, but also local damage to the heart valves, which translates into heart failure. So let's start with fever. Patients with endocarditis caused by Staphylococcus aureus will usually be very obviously acutely ill. Many of them will also be septic. Staphylococcus aureus is very aggressive, very virulent. It's quick to cause complications and it will kill your patient quite rapidly if you don't recognize it and treat it in time. Even with proper treatment, the prognosis is still uncertain. Let's put it that way, right? So if you have a septic patient and you can't find the source of sepsis, so it's not, not pneumonia or UTI or one of these usual things, always, always suspect that it might be Staphylococcus aureus. It's one of the most common 
causes of community acquired sepsis and again it's extremely virulent always consider staphylococcus as a possibility and if you suspect staphylococcus as a cause of sepsis automatically you have to suspect endocarditis as well because it's so prone to cause endocarditis it has such a high propensity to stick to the heart valves so if you do suspect endocarditis make sure you auscultate the heart carefully look for any new murmur now how can you know that it's new you can't but then if there is a noticeable heart murmur this does make endocarditis more likely maybe your patient has had it for 30 years it doesn't matter if you have a septic patient plus you hear a murmur you should always suspect endocarditis on top of that make sure that you examine the patient's skin carefully you will look for signs of septic emboli remember these small parts of vegetations that get lodged anywhere in the body they get lodged in very small blood vessels like the ones in fingers right so examine your patient's palms and feet very carefully look for these small spots and lumps they are usually a few millimeters in diameter they can be reddish purple brownish it doesn't matter some will be painful some won't but if you see this you have your diagnosis also take a close look at your patient's conjunctiva and the sclera this is where the septic emboli will be most visible but sometimes they are easy to miss unless you make an effort and actually seek them out right so always if you have a septic patient you don't know the source of sepsis examine the skin carefully especially the palms and the feet and check mucous membranes as well so this is staphylococcus aureus acute abrupt onset with sepsis and with these typical textbook symptoms of endocarditis including septic emboli but endocarditis caused by streptococci will usually be less impressive and harder to diagnose these patients many times they won't be septic they will just present with fever many times long lasting fever with night sweats with malaise and when you take some labs you will see leukocytosis with moderate neutrophilia let's say moderately elevated crp so it will look kind of bacterial but you won't be able to figure out what is actually wrong with your patient right away and this is what happens all the time doctors see that this could be something bacterial so they prescribe an antibiotic and the patient gets better while they are taking this antibiotic they do feel better but once they finish the course their symptoms reappear so they get another course of antibiotics or they go to a different doctor who gets them another course and they feel better again and this happens several times until they end up with one of the catastrophic complications of endocarditis for example a vegetation breaks off and ends up in the brain so they suffer a catastrophic stroke or sudden blindness or they develop heart complications so for heart failure this is what eventually happens so if you have a patient with prolonged fever that kind of looks then like it's caused by something bacterial always suspect endocarditis and examine these patients again very carefully carefully auscultate the heart look for signs of septic emboli they will not be as numerous and as impressive as in endocarditis caused by staphylococcus aureus or the more reason for you to be even more thorough and make sure you ask your patient about typical symptoms of metastatic infections because from the heart bacteria love to metastasize into the spine into the psoas muscle into the liver the spleen the kidney so ask your patient about persistent bad back pain loin pain or pain in the abdomen in the upper quadrants this is typical for abscesses in the spleen in the liver in the spine in, in the psoas muscle right many times your patients won't mention that because they will not associate this with fever so you have to ask them about these symptoms and many times you will see that they do actually have symptoms of these metastatic infections so remember these typical sites psoas muscle the spine the liver the spleen and the kidneys and if you suspect endocarditis basically there are two things that you need to do you need to take at least remember at least two sets of blood cultures but preferably more and you have to plan for 
heart ultrasound as soon as possible. With heart ultrasound, you will visualize the vegetation and with blood cultures, you will hopefully catch the offending pathogen because from the heart, again, bacteria spread through the bloodstream all over the place, but this doesn't necessarily mean that they're always present in the bloodstream. So you need to take more blood cultures because the more you take, the more likely it is that you will actually catch this bacteremia and identify the pathogen. Also, you will use imaging modalities like ultrasound, CT or MRI to detect abscesses in these typical sites depending on your patient's symptoms. Like you will use a CT scan to detect abscesses in the spine, in the psoas muscle. With ultrasound you can visualize abscesses in the liver, in the spleen, in the kidneys, right? So all of this will even further support your suspicion that you are actually dealing with endocarditis. But now let's turn this story on its head. Let's go the other way around. Let's suppose that you do an abdominal ultrasound for whatever reason and you find something that looks like an abscess in the liver or in the spleen or in the kidneys or you do a head CT scan and you find something that looks like an abscess or worse yet multiple abscesses what will you do well you have to think where did this come from where did this infection come from? I'm emphasizing this because clinicians often fail to make this connection. Also, let's suppose you take blood cultures for whatever reason and you end up isolating one of these usual suspects for endocarditis. So you isolate Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococci or other bacteria that cause endocarditis. Of course, if they are in the bloodstream, you have to think, where did they come from? You have to take a look at the heart valves. You have to suspect endocarditis. There is another tip. If you isolate Staphylococcus aureus in the urine sample, red flag, you have to suspect bacteremia. And if you suspect bacteremia, you will suspect endocarditis if we are talking about Staphylococcus aureus. Because remember, Staphylococcus is not really a urine pathogen. It doesn't really cause urinary tract infections unless there is a urinary catheter or, or some other device. So if there are no foreign bodies and you detect it in urine, you have to suspect bacteremia. Therefore, you will suspect endocarditis. So please remember this. Abscesses anywhere in the body, especially in these typical sites, these common causes of endocarditis in the bloodstream or in the urine, you should suspect endocarditis regardless of your initial diagnosis, your initial suspicion. And in the end, as I always say, ask yourself, who is my patient? If you have a patient with fever and you don't know the cause, if your patient has a known heart valve abnormality or if your patient is an intravenous drug user or you know that they have an artificial heart valve, you have to suspect, guess what, endocarditis. I hope that this lecture will help you in practice and that you will be able to suspect and diagnose endocarditis as soon as possible so that your patients have the best possible chance of survival and of complete recovery. If you like this lecture, you will absolutely love my course on recognizing serious infections early. If you work with acutely ill patients, again, I highly recommend you take it as soon as possible. Thank you for watching. Good luck out there and take care.